Um, thank you all. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Vaughan Lindsay, Chief Executive of the Darton Hall Trust. And I wanted to say a big thank you uh, for coming here and a big welcome uh, to Dartington. I was delighted when uh, Nick asked me to speak, albeit very briefly, um, partly because somebody had told me that you get asked to speak twice by SEUK at talks, uh, once on your way up and once on your way down. Uh, so welcome to my second talk uh, for SEUK. Uh, uh, um, Nick asked me to talk a little bit about how the Social Value Act has impacted on a social enterprise. We are a social enterprise at Dartington and what the impact has been on us. And I just wanted to say a little bit about Dartington, just to give you a bit of context, a little bit about the impact, which actually has been very little, but why that doesn't dishearten me, because I think there's still much that we can be positive about. So for those who don't know about Dartington, Dartington is a place of learning and experiment. We incubate, host and run a whole range of different activities in the areas of the arts, uh, sustainability and social justice. We run 24 programmes ourselves, we host about 100 others, and we have about 20 at the moment in incubation. Um, so we have quite a rich flow of different activities going on across the estate all the time. Uh, we employ about 350 staff. Uh, we have about just under a million visitors a year come onto the estate or engage with our various programmes. And we add about uh, 15 million worth of GVA, gross value added, to the community each year. So for us, a reasonably significant organisation in our patch. Well, not huge, but reasonably significant in our patch. And for us, we've also been on a journey ourselves. We started our lives as a, a, a philanthropy-driven organisation. We were set up by two very wealthy people um, who did huge numbers of remarkable things. And our recent journey has been about transferring ourselves from what I call a charity mindset, which is we do good things, give us money, uh, to a social enterprise, which is we do good things and we're going to earn our own keep as well. And our big journey has been a shift from an organisation that used to earn about 35% of its income to this year an organisation that has earned 95% of its own income. And I say that because I've always brought up, I was, my father was a very dour uh, Scottish Presbyterian minister and he spent all his time telling me you know, that if you have that you can't have this. Um, you know, if you have pleasure you've got to have some pain and if you do these things you can't have both. And he always, his favourite phrase was, you can't have your cake and eat it, son. And I always think, well, why the bloody hell not? I don't understand why you can't have both. And I don't understand why you can't deliver social value and social impact and run yourself as a really good business. It's not, these are not opposing things that we are told all our lives have to happen. And to me, that's been my drive here at Dartmouth to say, you know, we will continue to deliver great social value as we have done throughout our 90-year history but we will do it in a different way. We will earn our own keep. We can't rely on the fact that we just go out with a begging bowl uh, each year, not least of which, because it's bloody hard work doing that. It's much easier to earn your own, own keep. So for us, when I heard about the Social Values Act, of course, it's absolutely in our sweet spot. It talks to the three areas we're interested in, about the environment, the economy, and social justice, and it talks about how you can bring those together. So we were hugely excited when it happened, and we thought, great, great things will happen. And then there was this deathly silence, and... In reality, it's had very little impact on us, um, largely because it doesn't have a compulsion in it. It doesn't force people to do that. So it is an alliance of the willing. So unless people are that way inclined, they're not going to take advantage of it. They'll do what I do to my daughter all the time when she tells me all the things she wants me to buy. I go, I'll consider it, darling, but the answer's no. You know? And of course, that's what a lot of uh, public bodies will do. They go, yes, we've considered it, but the answer's no. Um, so that makes it very difficult because it doesn't have a compulsion element to it. The other thing which I think I've heard many of you talk about is about measurement, which is if you're not that way inclined, unless you can clearly measure the difference, they're only going to give you the nod if everything else is the same. So as long as you are equally of good value and equally providing a cost-efficient service, then if everything, Cetris Paribus, everything else is equal, they may well give you the nod because you add social value as well because they don't know how to really measure social value in a way that is widely understood. Um, now, we shouldn't be too worried about that. It took us, I remember, 20 years ago when we were struggling to measure the environment, and of course we got down to a simple metric of CO2 emissions, which is you know, flawed, but it is a simple measure everyone now uh, feels comfortable using. But that does enable people to only use it on the margins. So they'll say, if on balance everything else is equal, why wouldn't you choose uh, somebody who adds social value? 
I think the real test is when people are willing to make genuine trade-offs and say, I will take higher cost and I will take slightly more variable quality because I think the social impact is right. But you can only do that if you have really strong ways of measuring. And I think we've got a long ways to go in making that happen. Now, within the sector, we will talk about New Economics Foundation, Graham's here, you know, MPC, CAN, all these people doing great work. But I think it will only take root when the traditionalists start measuring it. And I feel slightly heartened because I was with our auditors, PwC, who are an interesting but fundamentally dull bunch. And they were talking about that. Oops, sorry. Yeah, thank you very much. Very good. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. But I was delighted when they were, of course, talking about their total impact measurement. It's got two M's. I don't know what the other M is, but TIMS. And actually, that's what it is. It's about saying, how do you balance the social, environmental, and economic values in hard metrics that enables you to make balanced decisions? So if you decide to do something that damages the environment, they can put a value on it, and you can begin to trade off whether you think the economic value of that. Now, that, to me, makes me heart. And when mainstream organisations begin to talk in that way, then it's not just us getting together, you know, preaching to the converted, but it is becoming mainstream. My test is if I can read it in The Economist, then I know it's becoming mainstream. And I think this stuff is beginning to get mainstream, which makes me feel uh, more uh, optimistic. The other thing which we've noticed when we've tried to think about what's the impact is in the end, it's about cost. So whenever I've gone to talk to public bodies, in our case, our district council or Devon County Council, which are big procurement here, in the end, you know, what dominates their thinking is, in this case, their 100 million cuts that they need to make. And whatever shape or form they give it in, what they're thinking about is, how can I get you to deliver my service cheaper? And they're trying to get you to cross-subsidise through your other income sources an ability to deliver what they knew they should do but can't afford to do anymore. And, of course, that's a very difficult uh, dialogue to have. Um, and that, I think, does contaminate some of the ability to really... People talk about working in partnerships and collaboration. Of course, everybody wants to do that. But for some public... You know, when you talk to the public sector, certainly when I've spoken to them, you know, they are just blinded, um, almost rabbits in headlight, by these enormous cuts that they are really struggling to work out how on earth do we do what we used to do or deliver it differently with that scale of cuts. And that makes some of the courageous conversations you want to have much, much harder to have. So I think the impact for us, while it should be our sweet spot, we, are, you know, we worry about the three areas that it should encompass. We are a vibrant and well-capitalised social enterprise, so we are well-placed to take advantage of it. Yet the, options have been, or the opportunities have been very limited for us. But I'm not downheartened by that, because I think, as many of you do, you have to stand back and see the wider uh, environment. And the wider environment is absolutely moving in the right direction. The very fact that we have a social value, that means we are talking about it, and that is a big step forward. We have other acts, like the Localism Act, which, of course, is giving more voice to local communities to help decide how their services are delivered. We have, when we see a whole range of indicators that show that people are thinking, um, unlike my dad used to say, actually, they do want their cake and eat it. They do want good businesses delivering good services, but adding social value. That's why we see such a growth in social enterprises. That's why we see a growth in things like community interest companies, a whole range of different things which make me think this is happening. And even when people like Michael Porter, I was reading, has launched his Social Progress Index, even he, of the die-hard economists, are saying, you know, no, we've got to measure something different than just economics. You know the tide is turning. Um, so while I would say um, it has been limited, the impact so far, I don't think we should be downheartened. I remember when we first started talking about the environment. It has taken many years for that to really get mainstreamed and people to take that, and I think we're on a similar journey, and we need to be patient but persistent in pushing our case, and I think we will get there. And I hope, in the end, that I can go back to my dad's grave and say, you can have your cake and eat it, mate. It's not such a daft thing to do. So I hope that's of help, and uh, again, uh, enjoy your time at Dartington. Thank you.